Hello. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us at Space Cowboy Books Online. Uh, today, we are here to celebrate the release of Eliane Bouy's Other Minds, a set of twin novellas from Dark Matter, Inc. Eliane is a Chinese Singaporean writer of speculative fiction. Her work has appeared in Clark's World, The Pen Review, Translunar Transit Lounge, and Weird Whore, among others. Eliane studied philosophy at the University of St. Andrews and interdisciplinary humanities at New York University. She has a working knowledge of bulk cargo ships and ports, regretfully terrestrial, which continues to inspire her writing. She usually gets her best ideas while trail running or swimming and sometimes manages to write them down. I'm going to hand it over to Eliane to read us a section from Other Minds. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm going to read from Carrier. So I'll start now. Mother. When she gets to the part when Cora steps off the gangway and onto the floating platform that rocks on the surface of the restless street, Mingwen slows the memory and tries to see something different. The small form, more at ease than when it first minced along the narrow catwalks over the water, is no longer a child, but further still from what it will become. She skips over the water with ungainly determination and turns back to her mother. I'm not afraid anymore, Mama. I'll show you, Cora says. Mingwen wraps her arms around herself and remembers the, dis the distinct flavors of each dish her father has prepared for their last meal together. An oyster omelette, a steamed parrotfish he'd later make apologies for, and noodles made from sweet potato because there is no more rice. Still, she says, Let's go inside, sweetie, and see what Gong Gong's made for lunch. Why can't Gong Gong come to the station with us? Cora tests the platform by jumping on it, until the sea pushes her back with a splash of surf on the metal alloy deck. When Ming Wen watches her now, she chews the inside of her cheek. Because he built this himself, she says to Cora, for him, home is still earth. Cora lifts her shoulders, her concerns already forgotten, and skips further out. They were lucky with the weather that day, on the Kelong. It was the perfect changing of the guard between the lashing rain and tide of the near constant state of monsoon and the slow burn under the magnified sun, which left crystals of salt on the decks of the fish farm. Miraculously, the bamboo roots of the farm still hold the structure fast to the shifting seabed, even while the rest of the platform drifts tethered for the time being. Cora stops where the catwalks of the platform meet the horizon. The clouds part, and they catch the light of the sun as though they too are part of the sea. Mingwen knows that each time she replays the scene, she misses the same things. Still, she watches herself, look away from the shack of salvage material where her father lives. She hears Cora say, I belong here too, if it was always like this. Mingwen stops the memory. This is how she wants to remember. Dreamer. Mingwen heard the sound from above her at the moment when sleep unfurls like a rising vapor and crept like fog beneath the doors of her mind. It was the sound of liquid droplets falling from a height, glassy and crisp. She didn't see the next drop until it was a bright, quivering orb of distorted light, seconds from hitting her eye. She tried to move her head away, but it didn't respond, even when she tugged until she felt the painful strain in her neck. The drop landed, and when it did, its cold moisture spread on the sides of her eyes and seeped into her skull, into the gaps between the mind and body, freezing them together. She blinked, but saw nothing. Not the dim light as seen through the red veined skins of closed eyelids or the darkness that is the absence of light, just nothing. Terra was the lonely companion to a voiceless scream as she clawed at a mouth that wasn't there. She opened her eyes. She could see again and she laughed loud at herself so she wouldn't hear the thumping of her heart in her chest. The centre of the corniced false ceiling was a deep earthy brown, where the liquid had soaked through. It wasn't then hour ago when she retreated from the formal introductions to the flight commander and crew, or so she thought. The, the stain grew bigger, which meant the source was still flowing. A groan stretched the length of the walls as the machine flexed, strained and tested the limits of its decorative casing. Mingwen gasped, and her fingers gripped the new sheets. Is anyone alive out there? Tiatrin said through the door. First maneuvers commence in half an hour. 
You better not be sleeping. She opened her eyes. A soft yellow glow emanated from the recessed bulbs in the false ceiling, which was now strong, sorry, which was now dry and spotless. A sound came through the walls again, but this time it was just the common rattle of a machine at work, which the ship was, a city inside a machine. Anxiety is not good for your swagger, she said to the commercial representative. She heard him rap once more, likely with the edge of an old ID tag he wore at the end of a fraying red lanyard. She'd never seen him without the relic from the past decade, coiling and uncoiling it around his broad knuckles like a hand wrap. Back at Kuang Engineering, commercial was the grief and envy of design, technical, and programming. But out here, light years from Earth, Theatrin's voice was almost a comfort. Mingwen pulled herself from off the bed. Her mid-length hair, still black where it wasn't white, stuck out in awkward angles that she didn't care to fix. Yesterday's clothes lay on the laminate flooring made to look like teak wood boards, the sharp corners of which failed to align flush with the walls. At the end of its trial voyage, the RS Infinite Dream would be marketed to individuals as a luxury residence in orbit, and this room would likely be rebranded as a stateroom. But Ming Wen was enough of an industrial designer to persist in calling it a cabin, at least while she occupied it herself. She'd excuse herself from the planning of the layout and interiors of the residential parts of the suite and was of the ship and was pleasantly surprised with the result. The ship was 15 years old, but that was 15 years under a different name, a former life of the infinite dream, its new carpet, china, stage rooms, and leisure facilities hid well. She balanced on one foot to slip on a shoe, but stumbled and hit her elbow on a porthole window, which looked out into a black expense with earth a mottled blue button in the distance. The tempered glass shook and the view flickered and drew close to the glass. Grey horizontal bars shifted across the unbroken emptiness and disappeared in the shimmer of aquamarine. The cosmos were replaced by a rippling sea. The current Earth date displayed at the bottom of the screen, August 15, 2086. Mingwen would later remember that this was the Earth's sun reflecting off the catwalks of the father's gallop before it was claimed by the tide. When she does remember, she will, re she will wonder how the dream already knew. That's the segment. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that excerpt. Uh, we're going to get into the interview section now. If anyone in the audience has any questions, please do feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll try to get to all of them. So Other Minds is, is your debut book, um, and it's a set of twin novellas. What made you decide to debut with this format? Um, actually, the, the story is I originally pitched um, Carrier. It was part of Pit Dark. And um, well, when, when Dark Matter responded and, and liked that story, we, um, we talked about uh, other stories that could possibly build that world. And Signal Tracer was was another novella I was, I was also trying to sell at the same time. So both of them are in the same world. They're about 40 years apart and they deal with similar themes, um, mostly loss and um, loss of relationships and a longing for better times, part of which, which amounts to nostalgia. And the construction of worlds to capture and recreate this, this lost reality. And to lose yourself in it so yeah that's that's how it came together really and um at first we were wondering how we might sell this because it's it's not a collection it's not a short story collection neither is it one novella uh, neither, neither is it one novel but um as we were editing it and, and thinking about it more i thought that um there it really is one world in in two novellas as well put it actually um because they both say the same thing across the same world and I hope that idea translates. <laughs> I really appreciated the format. Um, one, I'm a huge fan of novellas, but it also reminded me of the old Ace uh, double novels, where it would be two novellas in one, which is so cool. No one, no one does oh. that anymore. Um, nice. You mentioned in the acknowledgments uh, that Signal Tracer began as a short story. Um, what was your process like adapting a shorter work into longer form? Oh, that was a lot of fun actually and um both signal tracer 
and um, and carrier were short stories. Um, carrier started as as a novelette, if I'm not wrong, and yeah, Signal Tracer was a short story. Um, I just went back. Of course, I reread them, and I thought about the parts where you know I mercilessly cut to make five k or seven k in the other sense. Um, the world building that I could add to the stories to develop them, the subplots and, and the characters that could be added to it. Like for instance, um, in Signal Tracer, Roy and Phoenix are, are new characters. So Roy is actually just, just gets a passing mention. It's sort of a, a walk-on character in, in the short story. And their characters really developed in, in Signal Tracer. And uh, the sailor as well, and the sailors. If I may, if I may have a favorite character, I think the sailor's my favorite character. I had a lot of fun in the sailor because sailors everything and sailors whatever they want to be. Um, so I did that and um more it gave me more um more more breadth for scenes, I suppose, more. Because in the short story, everything happens in maybe three places. And in Carrie, of course, it just happens in one place, um, and the killer. So with the it was a lot of fun developing the short stories into the long form in that sense and I guess the short answer is I kind of winged it <laughs> I just winged it I just wrote it in in an additional week for each and they became longer <laughs> and do you have a preference uh short form mm -hmm. to long form um I think my preference is actually for the novella because I love both I've I've just finished two novels this year which was a, a bit of a shock for me the second one was a shock <laughs> Um, but I love the, the way I can just get to the point in the short story and I can just write it completely off the cuff, not even knowing where it's going to go. And a bit of that translates into the novella where, um, like for Carrie, I didn't know where it was going. And with Signal Tracer, I just wrote the, the character of, of the sailor as it came to me. So I think the novella is my favorite form because, um, you get that brevity of a short story while um while the, while you have the depth to to add the subplots and the additional characters so in both of these novellas um you mentioned they take place in in the same world um but mm -hmm. both of them uh occupy two different worlds an, an external world and an internal world or meet space versus the virtual world um how did your world building process differ uh for these different facets of the book, the 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 digital worlds and and the uh, the meat space worlds. Well, um, yes, the two worlds in in Signal Tracer, the the other world, the alternate world is is virtual reality. In Carrier, the alternate world is actually internal. It's just memory, um, which I mean, one replays over and over. And um, I would say that uh. In both cases, the ideal worlds are the opposite of reality, but they're not just entirely created. They are the internal that's that's externalized. So I rely heavy, heavily on, on sensory details because these are the, the positive triggers, and in some cases in, in carrier, some negative triggers that bring back the memories. So there are more smells and, 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 and sights and, and feelings and, um, and uh, just more sensory detail. Um, in the alternate worlds, like for instance, uh, the beautiful sunset in, in in Lion City, the feeling of the books in that bookshop that she goes to with, with her mom, and in Mingwen's case, you know that that sensation of of swimming, of drowning, of being overwhelmed by water. It's it's very, um, it's a lot more developed, I would say, than than what you call the meat space, where um, the narrative in the actual in, in the actuality is a lot choppier it's it's just entirely plot driven and it's it's just action um yeah i suppose that that would be the difference between the both of them and i suppose the i did have to research a bit more for the um at least for signal tracer because there is a bit of a bit of historical information in that so there's more research than that the physical not really it was um i suppose more scientific research for the, um to get certain parts of the ship correct and um, a lot of it was actually based off terrestrial ships of course because I have zero knowledge of spaceships and uh, as well as some sad research for what might be uh, lacking in the future like rice. <laughs> so. 
yeah, th those are the differences. And when writing, do you tend to start mm -hmm. with your world building or or with your characters? Oh, I start with the characters. I know, I know a lot of, um, or at least I think, I think a lot of uh, people uh, love the world building the most. Uh, for me, it always begins with the character, um, or it begins with the plot. Sometimes it just comes. I, it begins with a plot. I think for Signal Tracer, it began with a plot. Um, um, and one of the inspirations for that was um, the Inferno Affairs trilogy by Ellen Mark, which American audiences might know it as um, uh, The Departed, which was, which was re as it was redone by Scorsese. So it began with that. Um, so it's, it's interesting that the world came together around it because the world almost forms itself around the character through the character's eyes. So, you know, the world is nothing without the character. And I try to keep that in mind, at least for these two stories. There are probably other stories where one might start with the world first because the world is, is such a strong character that the world shapes um, the character itself. Um, of the two, perhaps um, Carrier has actually a stronger weight in world building off the ship, um, even though Signal Tracer is a lot more visual. Um, in Carrier, the world of the ship is probably more aggressive and more assertive, and um, it is as much a, a character as it, as it is a world. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> it does. Um, okay. And both of these definitely have cyberpunk elements. I, I've mm -hmm. found that cyberpunk often utilizes grammar in different ways than other forms of science fiction. Um, and at times, it, it's more terse. There's almost a, a clip to cyberpunk writing. Um, how did you play with grammar as part of your world building and setting? Um, I suppose by grammar, you mean sentence structure. And uh, yes, I think, yeah, it's right. I think um, Signal Tracer probably probably does have um, sort of short, choppy sentences, except where it goes on a bit um, with some world building in the middle. Um, I think that part of the reason for that is that uh, um, cyberpunk inherits a bit from noir writing and and the noir also has these choppy sentences stream of consciousness but written um almost aggressively you know like like being shot out of the mind and um if if it's not too cringe to say i think it's it's, it's like it mimics the um, feeling of being lost and, and grasping for something that you don't know that, that you don't know what you're looking for a breathlessness as the characters trying to navigate um, their disillusionment, what they thought they knew and what they are now realizing, finding themselves in a reality that they um, did not perceive earlier. Um, so yes, I think that's how the short synthesis came in. Although I think I tend to write this way as well, even when I'm not writing cyberpunk. Um, and more on grammar, um, in Carrier, I use the past and the present tense quite a bit. And in, in fact, in, in, in earlier drafts, it was a bit more messy. There was a lot more jumping between past and present and we, we made it a bit simpler so that the reader would not be lost. Um, that is supposed to signify uh, Ming Wen's loss between states of her mind and being unable to recognize whether she is still stuck in her memory and she is still trying to correct her past that she doesn't even know where she tripped up and failed and um, whether she's in the present and hopefully that creates the sense of of um, delusionment and and, uh, and loss in that story I think it did and and the, those punchy elements of the grammar I think do really enhance that I, I'm a big fan of that um, and what you just said perfectly leads us into our next question um, mm -hmm. Carrier uses a, a form of non-linearity um, for emotional effect, the way memories are handled and whatnot. Um, how and why did you use this technique? Because it was quite effective. Oh, thank you. Um, well, yes, yeah, just carrying off what I said earlier, Carrier is supposed to be like a nightmare almost, um, where the character is lost in her mind and the ship becomes an extension of that mind without hopefully without giving away my story um yes uh so she can't discern between reality and and her memory which she keeps returning to 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 look for clues for for where she went wrong 
um, so yes, what was I saying? Nightmare, like, yes. Um, so I, I suppose inspirations for that or, or similar stories uh, that, that have done this so well uh, are like Hill House and Sphere, which I love Sphere so much. Um, so I'm trying to create a bit of that in, in, um, in, in the non-linearity and uh, uh, I hope that was successful. <laughs> Does that answer the question? I think it was. There's a there's a bit of dis disorientation that comes from those techniques, mm -hmm. but it's a beautiful disorientation that really um, makes you empathize with the the character's feelings. So, yeah, good stuff yeah. there. Um, in Signal Tracer, um, it it gives a nod to Gogol, Dead Souls, um, in one of the chapter titles, and in ways um, without spoilers, um, you used a similar plot device in the book as well to to that book was this intentional and if so um how did you find dead souls inspiring or classic literature in general yeah it is it is just um yes it, it, the answer is yes it, it was sort of a springboard to that um yeah i i did actually read start off reading um a bridge classics when i was a child so i think when when i was a child a long time ago there <laughs> were not not as many uh, not such a breadth of of, uh, of ch children's literature and, and middle school literature as, as we do have now. So I read a lot of abridged classics and um, actually I've read a lot of other things since then. But um, this story sort of stuck with me. Um, so the basic plot is um, an upstart scammer buys um, the names of dead serfs to add to their property value so they can mortgage that property and for, you know, obviously build a build their fortune and um this made me think of uh inflation of value uh and paper trading of all things and as well as of election fraud where you know one buys votes by extension um so yeah i thought that was um an interesting point from which to um uh from which to jump start um uh the mystery in, in Signal Tracer. Um, and you know, it, it links to a lot of things that are wrong in society, this inflation of value and, and um, false appearances, which probably do not need elaborating on at this point. And I'm, I'm glad that came through. In a way, it reminded me of um, Alfred Bester's The Star's My Destination, or also known as Tiger Tiger. Um, oh. which is essentially a retelling of the Count of Monte Cristo in some ways, uh -huh. or it used devices from that. And and that was, um, as as someone who grew up reading the classics as well, I love those little, um, those gems. So one of the themes in the novellas um, is a retreat to the digital realm as things on the outside worsen. Um, what warnings and advantages do you think are meaning for, meaningful for a culture that increasingly does this? And and do you think that we're headed towards a world um, that like the ones expressed in these books? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes, in both novellas, I present nostalgia as a drug. Um, more obviously, in in Signal Tracer, although in Carrier, it is the same, but she trick she brings it on herself, and uh, the nostalgia is intoxicating, especially in Signal Tracer with the enhancements and the filters that allow creative license and even in Carrier Mingwen revisits her memory but it's not perfect memory it's not even memory as she has it in her head it's memory as she believes it should have been and she finds um she finds comfort in that the same way that um the characters in Signal Tracer find comfort in in a lost world that that was perfect you know in in, in their opinions um which is Lion City and um, of course, the question is, uh, was it really, well, firstly, did that really happen as you remembered it to have happened? And was it really that good? Um, is it really worth yearning for? And it's possible, it's, okay, it is highly probable that we see that already with people um, yearning for what they think are better times, you know, stronger values, et cetera, you know, with, Things were simple and neighbors were better, etc. And we can already see why that is is problematic because we were romanticizing something that you know had its had its own context and had its own flaws and 
might not even have it remembered correctly. And we're, it's also a sign, I think, of us trying to put back in the box what we see as, a pro what, what should be seen as progression of thought, of, of development, of values, and of the way people are and things that we should accept. Um, uh, some, quite often, this nostalgia is, is, not as, is not just harmless aesthetics, it's a wishing to put all this progress back in the box and return to so-called simpler times. And um, nostalgia should, wouldn't do that. You know? um, so that's part of the um, arc of both stories is that uh, you have to face the past and for its flaws and for your mistakes in it that made it, that made, it, that made the world and you what it is today in order to fix what's wrong now instead of hiding in an imaginary past. So hopefully that's, that's a lesson to be picked up on. You also seem to use that um, in an interesting way that gave um, the characters a versatility uh, in a way to be um, more than one person uh, or, or to idealize oneself. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit, particularly the way that you handled it in Signal Tracer? Um, okay, let me think of what to say. In Signal Tracer, I mean, one thing unique about Signal Tracer Okay, not unique to me, but you know, one thing about the story is that it has two um two main characters who are older women, and they're both they're both in their sixties, and which well, such characters are not normally at the forefront of many stories, and the virtual world gives C in particular the chance to be what she isn't. You know, she's um she's Maggie. She's she's glamorous. She's assertive. She's um, she's beautiful. She's uh, she's confrontational. She takes things head on, and she solves problems. Is Maggie is everything that C isn't, and and she, for a long time, for many years, she indulges in this alternate reality in order to live the person that she wishes she could be, where she has to realize that all she has to do is be that person that she already is without the mask of virtual reality, um, and in carrier there's a bit of that as well because Ming Mingwen puts herself and more into the construction of the ship and um the ship becomes an extension of herself in a way that what she really needed to do was to um to confront what she had been avoiding and uh her misplaced trust and her own delusions in um in what she could do and what she should have done with the ship uh as opposed to uh uh, retreating with, within her her dreams for it. Sorry, does that answer the question? It does. It does. Um, <laughs> Sorry so, about that. <laughs> Sorry quite all right. Quite all right. Um, in Carrier, the the spaceship, in a way, is one of the main characters. Or that's at least how I read it. Um, how did the process of using a part of part of the setting for characterization work for you? Oh, um, I think Carrier's the favorite, my favorite story that I've, I've written, I had written until then. Um, I love it when a setting becomes a character, you know, um, because I'm not normally heavy on world building. I think, I think I like to focus on the character and the plot and, and my plots are pretty, pretty linear and quite simple, I think. Uh, so in Carrier, the ship. Mingwen builds the ship, but then the ship then builds itself around her and traps her in in her memories and her mistakes. So I, I really liked um having the ship sort of intrude aggressively on her thought and her uh, and and her plans and and remind her almost of of her arrogance in in the process of this this construction what she thought she could do what she thought she was doing as well as what she thought she she heard from her mentor from uh from her collaborators and and from her daughter yeah um sorry what's the question about how it was done or if i did it i'm sorry uh did you, pre you, you okay. pretty much answered the question actually um All right. I, I I like that interplay when when you know different parts of structure overlap in that way. Yeah. So I found that delightful in that particular mm -hmm. story. Oh so, yes, and that is also a bit of an homage to um to Spear, 
Yes. Which I have actually, I watched a film when I was too young, and I won't say how young because, you know, that's a secret, but um, the book, however, has such an, has such an impact on me. I, I love how the ship in, in Sphere is, or the ship, the, the orb, the thing in Sphere is, is a character, and well, without spoiling the plot of a very old book, it's more than just a character, uh, and it's, it's the whole um, the whole atmosphere and the, the the whole plot of the book is that character of the ship that I you know, I guess I tried to bring a bit of that to to carry as well. So you mentioned earlier um, that you've re recently written some novels. I wonder if maybe you can tell us a little bit about those. Uh, with if if it's not giving too much away, um, what you're currently okay. working on and what's coming up next for you. Okay, so. Um, the main thing I'm supposed to be working on is um, editing Club Contango, which is my new book that's going to be coming up next year in November with Dark Matter Inc. as well. So I'm really excited to be working with them again. It's um, it's about a single mom who runs an illegal micro casino with her best friend on an asteroid station. And uh, well, things get sticky when she um, discovers the, the dead body of a former associate and, and the fine print on an, an old AI training job comes back to haunt her. So she finds herself um, trying to reclaim her life from versions of herself. That's a very long, very long breath elevator pitch for that story. But uh, it's, it's in the same world as Signal Tracer and Carrier. It sort of bridges the both of them, actually. So I'm, I'm quite excited about it. Um, it's a bit of a return to the voice of Signal Tracer. So it's closer to cyberpunk. And so yeah, I'm deep in development edits for that. Wish me luck. Um, uh, earlier this year, I wrote wrote another book, which I'm I'm still sort of tinkering with and trying to query and etc. Um, I would describe it as Ad Astra meets um, Courage Under Fire, which is I think one of the one un underrated novel uh, film. Uh, and uh, well, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I haven't been able to write a lot of short stories because of that, because two novels so far in one year has been a bit of a lot, a lot for me. Uh, but I do have like, I think about two or three stories which uh, were committed earlier should come up late this year. And, and yes, trying to catch up on my reading pile, which just grows and grows because people, everyone writes such wonderful books and I want to read all of them, including the books that have not been published. And uh, you know, marks on my on my Kobo, so I will never catch up. <laughs> we are living in a fortunate time for speculative fiction. Um, so many wonderful things going so on. It's hard to read it all, but we're never going to run out of good things to read. So that's that's the mm -hmm. silver lining. Um, Elian, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us. For the mm -hmm. audience, go out and get yourself a copy of Other Minds' wonderful twin novellas. Uh, there is a link in the chat for those if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, there's a link down below. Um, thank you so much to our audience. Eliane, wonderful to speak with you finally. And uh, looking you. forward to your upcoming books. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye.